Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. And uh, yeah, for, we are super excited for today's session. We have Tura, Ramsha, and Hardik joining us. And it's from all over the world, uh, Singapore, Pakistan, and India. So um, yeah, we wanted to get to know uh, everyone a little better before we start our session. Uh, so could you share with us, uh, what is your ideal coding environment? Uh, do you like to code with music, without music? Um, yeah, do you prefer standing or sitting? And how Tuya, I know you were... <laughs> yeah, how many monitors? Uh, Tuya was sharing that you use uh, dark, dark mode instead of light yep. mode. Yeah, uh, yeah, why don't you start off? A uh, sure thing. <laughs> I think I my mode differ from uh, a task that I need to do. If I'm going to do something mundane, I probably have a music on, you know, very chill. I don't have to think so much. But if I have to like dig into my my soul and find the solution sort of thing, then I probably want a very quiet environment with like you know, I don't have to look into the answers and stuff. So. Yeah, it depends on the task and my mode. Most of the time, I will have two screens. So like like one for my uh, communication stuff. So if people want to ping me on Slack or whatnot, right, it will be another screen. So that if I'm focusing on my code, I don't get disrupted from the, all the pinging and the notifications. And uh, my code will be on the larger screen. And then I will have external keyboard so I don't have to really touch my laptop. I just put it one side and then, yeah. So I will, I'm totally isolated from all the communications that I can focus on my tasks and only then I go back to it, like I need to update my tickets. So once I'm done with the task, I go back to my laptop and like, oh, I tell my boss, I update the team, I'm done with this, then I go back to my task again. Wow, that's, I, I like how you actually segregate between like, you know, serious work mode and calm. Yep. So how about you, Rocha? How do you manage your, your space to be the most productive now that we're all working from home? Um, uh, I think I, I like music too, like having music in the background. Um, and then I like to write on a piece of paper. So usually if there's like a code that I have to write that I have some instructions for, I would first write it down on, on paper or maybe on the whiteboard if I'm in the office um, and then start coding. That really helps me move the idea from not code to code. Otherwise, if I start directly from the code, I would be rewriting it like five or six times <laughs> just to get the same results. Um, and then I'm, I'm okay with having people around <laughs> and having the lights on. So <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's all good for me. All right. So I'm so a dark mode fan. Okay. Well. Oh, so you don't have to go into the full like hoodie hacker mode to code. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm not a hacker. That's why I'm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is probably a hacker. Yeah. <laughs> this is fishy now. <laughs> so I prefer dark mode as well. And uh, I like keep the, keeping the music on, on a good volume actually. And then the volume uh, goes hand in hand with the, you know, the kind of problem I'm solving. If it gets tougher, the volume goes a bit down. So some, sim something similar to Thura, I would say. So <laughs> when I have yeah. to concentrate much, I take it down a lot and then I keep working and yeah, that's about it. So yeah, know I'm you know, I find music very distracting. If I need to write, I find that I do need to turn off all the singing music because then otherwise I want to sing along. Yeah, in fact, you, you want to focus, but you know, the other half want to party and like, no, 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 I can't party now, right? I'm, I'm dying here. <laughs> oh no. We're working to party to uh... Yeah, <laughs> it's like left and right. <laughs> So we know if uh, you don't have music on, we can't disturb you, right? Like, yeah, in serious work mode. Yeah. <laughs> if there's no noises, no one will dare to come into my room because they will think like I'm talking something seriously or doing something serious. So no one disturb me. Yeah. Nice. Uh, thanks so much for sharing it with us. And I think, uh, yeah, we are going to be starting our session really soon. Uh, there are quite a couple of people who are tuning in to join us now. So, um, yeah, we'll do a quick introduction to the session. So, meanwhile, we will move you folks uh, to the backstage. See you shortly. Hi everyone again, a uh, big hello to all of you. I'm Jia Sing. 
and I'm Janice. We're both from the Google Developer Space team, looking after all of our developer and startup community engagement in the Southeast Asia region. Thank you for joining Lakopi today. We hope everyone is keeping safe and well wherever you are. Uh, do let us know in the live chat where you're tuning in from. Yeah, so we're actually based here in Singapore. And in case we have friends who are joining us here for the first time, let us share a little bit about who we are and what this is all about. So Google Developer Space, which is actually a physical space previously, but now a virtual YouTube channel. This is a place for developers and startup folks like yourself from around the region to get together to learn, engage, and be inspired. We want to empower and connect the community to our people, programs, network, and technologies. So Lakopi at Developer Space is our monthly open mic night for developers in our community to learn, connect, and be inspired by one another. Every month, a tech team is selected and developers submit their topics to be shared with the community. And this month, our topic is on machine learning. And we have a total of three speakers joining us. So they are from uh, Singapore, Pakistan, and India, respectively. They will each be sharing for about 10 minutes, and we will have a short Q&A after each session. So do submit your questions on our YouTube and Facebook page, uh, and we will answer them after each speaker. So for today's session, uh, we have Tura Jo, who will be sharing an introduction to federated learning. Um, Ramsha Siddiqui diving into core, core reference resolution with TensorFlow. And last but not least, Hardik Nahata, who will share about question generation using na natural language processing in EdTech. So without further ado, let's welcome our very first speaker, Tura Jo. So Tura is an experienced ML engineer who likes to create applications, build data pipelines, and love to move them to production. So he's passionate about AI technologies, mini reinforcement learning, computer vision, and generating adversarial networks. So today, Tura will be sharing a brief introduction of what federated learning is and why it's needed in the current industry. He'll cover the various type of federated learning and their usage, and end with describing the different strengths and weakness of each of this function, the popular frameworks, and the resources where you can learn more on how you can take this on yourself. So over to you, Tura. Thank you, Janice. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving me a chance to share this particular topic. And thank you so much for tuning in. I know time is precious for everyone. And you know, the most expensive gift you can give anyone is time. And you can be doing anything you like, but you decided to tune into this session to listen about me talking about federated learning. So I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. So uh, before we get into this federated learning, I just want to say a few things about it. So yeah, this is me. I'm currently working as a machine learning engineer. I also do a little bit of podcast hosting. And uh, yeah, I like to share things that I know with the community. So I do share a little bit uh, here and there based on the requirement and based on the topic that I'm familiar with. So currently, I'm doing Masters of Computing in AI at National University of Singapore. So previously, I was graduated from University of Glasgow. I'm doing honors degree in computer science as well. So yeah, I'm pretty much deeper into the IT area, I would say, than uh, traditional, you know, machine learning people tends to have more mathematic background rather than CS. So yeah, this is taking a point of view from a CS person. Rather. And uh, this is how I started my career. Uh, around 2016, I started working as a research engineer in ASTAR. And then I moved over to becoming a software engineer sort of thing. And uh, we, I'm working for the de software development department for about a year. So after that, the AI became popular. And then uh, I went to get an, on board into the new technologies. And I'm also excited about the new things that we are going to do, we are going to learn. So I joined to AI Singapore, which is the governing body for the AI here in Singapore. So they do uh, a lot of courses. And they do also have uh, programs for you to attend to become an AI engineer. And after I have learned my skills and craft, I moved on to you know test out my skill in the real world. So I decided to join Any Digital. So who ever not from N, uh, Singapore? So Any Digital is uh, like a digital wings for NTUC National Trade Congress, and uh, we are sort of you know responsible for developing digital solution for all the others. Uh, entities in the NTUC campus. So I'm working as a machine learning engineer over there. And uh, it's been a very uh, 
good journey so far since 2019. It's already 2021. I'm still there, so it's a very good journey that I, I've been uh, going through. So uh, just a little bit of uh, disclaimer before I move over to the slides, right? So the presentation that I'm going to do is only for educational purpose only, and uh, it's not going to make you, uh, how do I say, the, a specialist in federated learning, or it's not going to give you uh, necessary skills to conduct a workshop yourself, right? And whatever I have going to mention here is that it's entirely based on my uh, opinions and my, my learning rather than a uh, standard textbook sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, so don't take uh, a lot of things that I'm going to say as a, as a textbook and, you know, uh, please, please feel free to research the material that I'm going to provide. So I do provide a lot of uh, resources I learn from, so you could also learn from it and also be more proficient than I am. And if I do any mistakes or if I mention something that is wrong in your opinion, please feel free to contact me. I, I'm uh, more than happy to discuss with you. And uh, if I need to be do any correction, I will do it. So no no worry at all. And at any point in time, if you need any uh, clarification, any questions, please feel free to comment and I will try my best to give you an answer. Even if I can't, I will try to email you afterwards, right? So no worry. So yep. Uh, and uh, the, the, the slides encompass a lot of images and videos and the content. So I didn't create any of this, right? Uh, because I'm not an active federal learning researcher. So what I did is I just try to consolidate things that I learned uh, when I was doing for my day-to-day -day work. So I just want to make it available for everyone, things that I learned, things that I gathered. So make them into one deck so that I could easily share to everyone. But I do not own any of the contents over here, just to be clear. So, yep, without further ado, let's get deeper into the content. So I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with data science. So data science, in my opinion, is about extracting insight from your data, and then you use them to solve the problems across the domain, right? So a lot of people talk about data science being uh, just building models or you know just trying to do analysis, but data science is actually much more than just building a machine learning model, right? It's it's all about extracting insight and you know try to use them to your advantage. So without using those insights that you get from the exploratory analysis or the the prediction value that you get from the model, and there's no point doing any any data science stuff because if you're not going to use it, what's the point of doing it anyway? So if you are familiar with it, you will know data science actually, uh, standard data science like machine learning uh, is, is going to work like this, right? So you have a particular group A, group B, group C from the right side. So you have a lot of data from a different entity and you try to gather them into a one trusted party. It can be your own environment. It can be your own uh, organization. Just consolidating everything, you just train on it and then you produce a final model. Right, that's typical standard machine learning works. You you collect your data, you try it, uh, you clean it, you then you train on top of it, then you get your model. All right. So what's wrong with having this kind of standard model, right? Is that when the new uh, privacy laws or you know GDPA, PDPA sort of things comes in, and suddenly the entities from different organization can share certain part of your data anymore. For example, in this photo. Right, the group A, you can share certain features out of it. Maybe it can be a, a person name, a person phone number, or, or their date of birth, or things like that. And group B, they can share uh, one of the features that you're supposed to use, right? And group C, they can't totally share. It may be because their financial record, hospital records, their health record, they can't totally share with any of the third party anymore. Then what happened to your previous framework, right? You are supposed to gather everything, train it using a third party, right? You're gonna you go to consolidate everything and you wanna train it on top of it. But without all these features coming in from different entity, you can't really train a final model. So this is actually, uh, in fact, a lot of machine learning models these days. If you are in active space, you probably like try to find a workaround, try to anonymize the data using hashing and things like that. But when it's really can't hash anything and you really need to share the data to make it work, then you need to find a way to work around this solution, right? This problem is actually affecting everyone based on the privacy issues. So the researcher were thinking hard and then they try to say like, oh, if we can't bring the data to us to train the model, 
how about we bring the model to them to train the data and then we bring it back just the model right so it might work when if you if you really think about it if we if we can't bring a data how about we bring a model to them so that actually one of the initiative that they try to do just by bringing the model to the individual entity right so we i don't really need your data to send to me anymore so what i need to do is i want you to train the model based on the data that you have and then i just take back all the wakes from the model so it looks simple from the diagram but there's a lot more thinking and a lot more architecture uh, a lot more uh, calculation is going to happen at the back end so uh, i just want to stress that this is actually a uh, very active research area and a lot of things are changing rapidly and then if you are following this right or whatever i say it might be outdated maybe six months or one year from now just to bear in mind that things i'm going to say is going to change really fast right so this is how they are going to do it let's say we are going to try a um, linear regression model so step one you have a master model who is going to have uh, just a straight line that's a slope right and it's going to copy out does exact same model that master has to all the all the uh, branches right all the nodes so from the central server copy out from the step two i'm going to copy out everything the same right then from the step three they will each use their own data to actually train the model and obviously when you train the model used on the data right your slope going to change right your weight is going to change so once your weights are changed which mod okay uh so okay, let, let's let's talk about this for a while. Then um, I will get back to your question. So this is basically just a linear regression model. So you are trying to fit the data, the close set fit, right? If you do high school math, you're probably familiar with this kind of diagram. So once you have it, then you sort of train everything. All your data are actually stay in the entity itself. Then you just get back all your weights into the central server or the model server. Then you average out all the weights, right? Then you get your final model. That's, that's one way to actually train that you bring a model to the data and then you get back the data. You get back the model that train on the data to create another uh, model, the final model. So you, so the Ashe is really asking questions regarding the, the which model to train for any particular problems, right? So I would like to say that there is no uh, fixed rule that which model is good for which sort of problems. It really depends on how you craft the problems, right? Let's say you're going to try going to try a uh, classification like image classification. Uh, people would try to suggest that you do uh, k-means or you, you you try to do any of the classification problems and see which one actually suited for the best right and uh, some people will argue that i would try to convert all these things all the images into uh, a separate domain and try to do a clustering on top of that or even like uh, some it depends on your problem right so if your problem is more for classification you can try all the classification model and then see which one perform the best for your data set and uh also if you are if you are like familiar with deep learning, things like that, you can try building a deep learning model, not just a machine learning model. And also whether you have how many data set you have. If your data set is very low, then you probably have to stick to like transfer learning where the pre-trained models are available. All you have to do is just update the weights based on the data that you have. So it is really depends on how you craft the problems and also what kind of training data set that you have. It's not like, oh, I want to do classification that I use this model. I want to do regression that I use this model and yeah, things like that. I hope that clears up your confusion. So there isn't a, a rules. If someone has a rule, please let me know. I'm going to just write it down in, in somewhere. It's going to be very helpful for my job, but I, I haven't came to that rule yet. So yeah. In, in the audience, if someone has a rule, which model can map to which problem, please let me know. Yeah, I, I, I will pay you as well. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So let's moving on to the next steps. So similar distributed weight. OK, so there's another question. Is that uh, assumption that local data should be similarly distributed to the weights of the central? Yeah, so, so I will go through that kind of architecture here as well, because uh, Sometimes people like to assume that, uh, like, like you said, different weights or the same weights across every 
every model. So I'm going to do just the normal average. But some people like to do like a uh, weighted average and see it is also another hyperparameter that you have to tune it, right? So when you train the model, you are basically tuning hyperparameter for the specific model. But in this kind of condition, you also have to train uh, hyperparameter in the sense that how many how many of the nodes I need to take in, right? And how much do I have to wait for each particular node that I want to do? How trustworthy is particular node, right? And uh, depends on whether I want to take it or I want to reject it. It's also it also another another decision make you have to make as an architect for this kind of thing, right? So uh, the one that I mentioned just now is just an example, and a lot of things that you need to consider are those kind of things, right? Whether you you assume that all the data is coming in, and even some sometimes you you might even consider things like invalid classes uh, based on the node. So node one may have five classes, but node two only, and node two and three only have two classes. How do you solve this kind of problem, right? So those things are also uh, your decision whether you want to just uh, chop it off at uh, you know two classes, or you want to make sure you collect more data for node two and node three to get more balanced classes. So these kind of things are actually based on the people who create this kind of solution, right? There's no uh, there's no correct rule. I would say you you keep on trying until you get the best result out of it. Yeah, I hope that answer your questions. So yeah, let's move on to the architecture part. I think after this, you probably have more idea on what I mean by different architecture and you know, different way to consider. So uh, from what I read, there are three types of architecture that you can adopt. So centralized, decentralized, and uh, heterogeneous. I will give you a little bit deeper into what it means in terms of architecture. Right, so architecture, this is a centralized architecture. As I mentioned previously, each model will train on their own respective data and they will upload their wigs to the central server or the central model. Then the central model will then either average it, weighted average it uh, based on the algorithm that you choose to, to consolidate it into a final model. Then they will distribute back, right? So this is one of the architecture you can adopt. But the downside is that once the central server goes down, your all the others connections are lost. Right? You have a central point, it's like one point of failure, the single point of failure. Once the server's down, it, the whole system doesn't work. So that's one of the downside, right? The, the another downside is that your central server need to be bigger than everyone, right? Because you're going to be collecting, communicating with everyone. So if your central server is not strong enough, you might create bottlenecks, right? You can communicate with all the other nodes as fast enough, or maybe you are causing the delay in the network things like that. So so another way to like solve this kind of like overcome this kind of solution, right, is that people propose decentralized federated learning. So if you are from the networking perspective or if you are a CS student, you will actually familiar with this kind of diagram because this is more of uh, how you update uh, things among the network, right? So IoT people, networking people, they should be very familiar with this thing. The this thing is that there's no central uh, server in this federated learning approach, where they have uh, each each individual cluster or nodes will determine when do they update, and they will talk to everyone in the network, right? So from the left side, it's actually communicate with everyone, and uh, from the right side, it's actually communicate with everyone as well. So there's no central point of failure, there's no single point of failure, and uh, the downside of using this is that your network will be over flooded with a lot of communication, right? Everyone wants to talk to everyone. And uh, how do you know how much is enough, right? So let's say you have uh, 1,000 devices and you receive 999 devices. Do you wait for one device remaining or do you just go ahead and update it? Uh, so you have to set a threshold how much. So yeah, the sound family with distributed learning. So distributed learning actually, I think is that you need to share the data. So like, I haven't been really deep, deep into distributed learning, but if I'm not wrong, distributed learning also want you to share the data. Your model has access to the data, right? Then uh, it's very similar to it, just that this one is sharing the weights rather than the data. So you don't have like the, the sense of batch from the data that you, you send it to uh, another GPU to train it and then you, you, you consolidate it back. So there, there isn't any data transferring happening here. It's only the wigs are being transferred. Right, I hope that answer. 
uh, if, if you're not satisfied, I could really uh, deep into it and then send you an email. Yep. Okay, so yeah, it, a, lot of, a lot of concepts that you see here is will be very similar to what we have already been doing in the in a, in a day to day work, right? Like distributed computing or even edge computing. Some people will say, oh, this is very similar to edge computing. But the thing is, the, 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 the main point of Faraday learning is I'm not sharing any data with anyone. So all I share are the wakes of my model, and that's it. Yeah, that's the that's the whole difference. Like. That's what I think. Yep. So the next thing is is more like you know different nodes or different cluster will have uh, different sizes and uh, different features. Then how do you consolidate all these things from from uh, making it work? Like usually in IoT devices, different devices will have uh, different capacity, different uh, processing power. So you can't have like very big model going to a small device where they can't even put everything into memory to do inference, things like that. So this hydro, uh, heterogeneous federal learning is actually a framework that is proposed by uh, some research group. So I also have a link that you can look into it. And they published a paper about this. This is one of the uh, novel approach that they are trying for different type of cluster and uh, imbalance sort of performance in the in the local devices, right? If you are very familiar with it or you want to deeper into it, right, you could actually take a look. And uh, if you ask about how the model wakes going to update, right, because different devices will produce different wakes and then like like the previous assumption that the weights are used on central server equally, or in this kind of uh, this kind of high, this one high, heterogeneous framework, they sort of have a weighted so sum for weighted sum or weighted average of the weights, right? Because local server uh, local parameter W one is contribute a very large amount of weights for the global model, and also like uh, local local weight W one or uh, WL two is going to contribute maybe about a quarter and then uh, small ones will only contribute about uh, one eight or one twelve. So this is how they decided to use. So the, the hetero FL is actually a framework. They published a paper. Then you could actually go and take a look how they actually implement it in a ways that is support the heterogeneous for learning approach. Right. Uh, so, so after we have talked about the architecture stuff, Right, and uh, because that Hey, Tuya, you seem to be on mute. We can't hear you uh, for a little while. Yeah. I think like the past two sentences. Uh, hello, can you hear oh, me Oh, yeah, you're back. Yeah, okay, thanks. thanks. Uh, I, I just hear some noise and like, okay. Thanks so much for notifying. Right, uh, so there are different kind of, different architecture of federated learning, but there are also different type of federated learning, right? So if you are, uh, if you're going to think about implementing a federated, uh, implementing a machine learning system that going to like not share the data, how do you make sure, right, each individual has a same data set or same features, right? So there's a horizontal federated learning that is from the left side, number A. So client A and client B, they all have the same features and the target, right? So all they have to do is just train on it, and then all your model probably share the same weights, right? And then they just consolidate them back. So the next thing is the vertical. So the vertical, if you notice from the diagram, client A and client B doesn't share the same features. So A has one, two, three, and B has four and five, but B has the target. So they have to do what they have to do is they can't just train the model like solely used on the cent uh, client A. What they have to do is they have to communicate, right? Either each batch or maybe 1,000 epoch, 2,000 epoch, they have to consolidate it back and then try to find whether this particular direction that the client A model is going is correct or not. So if you talk about uh, neural network, right, there will be a bad propagation. So bad propagation is uh, calculated on the central server instead instead of calculating on the local. I hope that clears up the, the vertical versus horizontal. Then uh, some people are exploring transfer learning for federated things as well. So federated learning uh, is not just, you know, just train the model. There are also people exploring the transfer learning as part of it. Transfer learning, if you're not aware, is that people really train the model using a lot of data set. Then all, if you, are, if you want to use it, right, you could 
you could use you could salvage some part of the train model that some people has already trained to suit your need, right? So that's what they uh, they were trying to do, right? So the next slide that I have here is how do you do uh, federated transfer learning? So the federated transfer learning in this diagram and the, the research paper that I link here that you could you know go in, go in down and see that there's their data from A that is being trained on using the the normal federated learning. And then if you want to transfer some of the model, there are some overlap here that uh, you can you can leverage on. And then you train entire set of um, data set from B using their new features or things like that. And then uh, yeah, you could you could just use that label and data set from B to boost up or speed up your training using the data set that you train from A. So, so this is like the federated transfer learning. This is pretty new, so if you want to know more, you could actually follow the research that's happening, and uh, different people will implement different way. And it's very exciting time to be alive now that you know uh, everything happened online, and you also can see everything that's happening in a real life uh, sort of approach. Right. So uh, after I have talked about all the architecture and and also the the type of machine learning, I want to give you one use case example that uh, actually Google has done. So if you read, if you're following Google sort of blog, Google blog or Google News, you could come across this kind of uh, announcement that they are using federal learning for their Gboard on Android. So uh, things that you type to your friends are not being transferred over to their server. I think it only I uh, used it to train the recommendation model that is uh, used for recommending places. Right. So how they architecture it? Is that is like this? So it start from the top, which is here. You have a central model that is being distributed to everyone, which is all the Android phones, right? And each Android phone user will use depending on their personalized content or their personalized usage. It will the model will change, right? Because they train on the model of the data or the usage data, it will change to uh, whatever type here. And then each individual user will have their own. Uh, model trained on their personalized data, right? So all the personalized data will be uh, stay in the device, but the weights that in train will transfer back to their server. As you can see, different user will have a different sort of model produced. Uh, you can see from all the shape here, rectangle, diamond shape, star shape, etc. And then it will be sent back to the cloud. So only the weights of the model will be sent back and then it will do some processing, be it uh, weighted average or weighted sums or more of an algorithm. And then they will have a new model that is generalized across all the user. Then it will then send it back to the, uh, distribute back to all the users again, right? So after that, the user will use again, train again, come back again. And uh, yeah, the circle repeats and repeats, right? So the, the questions now here is that what if there only is one or two user, right? And you are sending back one or two data and you are only learning from one or two data and then you send back one or two model. Isn't it the same as just using the data to train the model? So Google imposed some of the limits, right? If the, the user is below some threshold, they don't bother with updating so that people can't identify like individuality of the, of the model. So you can't, associate this model come from this person, right? That, that's what they, they told in the blog. So I think they probably do a lot more than what I'm just simply explaining, but to, to prevent the privacy uh, from the user. Yeah, this is how they implement it. I hope that it clears up. If not, we could uh, discuss it later on, right? So yeah, so the benefits of using this kind of approach is that it doesn't require data to be uploaded across everywhere. And it provides more privacy because the data never move out of the system or is move out uh, the weights of the model, right? And uh, it's suitable for uh, environments like the hospital, right? So, uh, and government's institution where the privacy is really, really strict and the data leaks are really, really serious. And uh, it also makes the real-time prediction possible because your models is actually with the device, right? So in typical machine learning stuff, you will be, uh, sending back the data or, or the, the input back to the server and the server will infer it, send it back the result. So there's always a lag time from transferring to the devices to the central server. But in this case, the model resides on your device.
so they could do a lot of a lot faster prediction and uh yeah uh, at, the, at the expense of you know you have to set up all the architecture and uh, make sure everything works smoothly and bear in mind that there's nothing uh limiting from from the aspect of privacy but from the accuracy perspective right when you try to average out everything it might not work as uh intended right so it might so there might be two extreme coming and then you sort of average it out and they cancel each other right so uh, the accuracy might slightly suffer and uh depends on the framework that you're using some of the model that you use might not support in in this kind of uh, environment but they are always adding new things because this is a this is a very new p field that uh, people are trying to work on it right so just wait for a while and hopefully you know a lot of models are available there for you to try out so yeah if you are interested to find out tensorflow has a tensorflow federated version so if you're familiar with tensorflow a lot of things should be very familiar to you and uh yeah, I actually added a tutorial link. Yep, tutorial link here, uh, tensorflow.org federated tutorial. So if you want to learn more, like just like the one that we, we actually went through, if, you, if you're new to this TensorFlow, there's a lot of tutorial, like uh, you know, try to classify the digits and stuff like that. So if you want to do more about TensorFlow federated learning, you could actually explore this tutorial and uh, they could explain I think a lot clearer and better than I, I could ever do, right? So, and uh, if you are worried about the code stuff, this is actually one of the sample code that uh, TensorFlow Federator has provided. It's the complete code that you could run it using a tree client. So the code, in terms of code wise, it's not so much, right? It's just the architecture behind it, right? So don't worry, don't have to worry so much about the coding. Yeah, so if you uh, want to explore other framework, right, there's also, framework like safe and uh, fade i'm just trying to filter out the best one or i could say the most popular one that people voted online but there's like tons of uh, popular framework open source available currently using uh be it apache or be it uh, c plus library there's a lot of other things right even if you don't want to start with python there's also other library that support different languages as well right so there's uh pretty much. So these are all the resources that I have uh, went through. So if you want to read more, deep dive to it, you could also go into these individual links and find out, right? Uh, yeah, there's a lot more resources that I provided here. And if you want to keep in touch, try to yeah, ask me questions, try to discuss things, you could always email me, uh, you know, try to find me on LinkedIn just by scanning the QR code over here. It should bring me to my LinkedIn profile. Then you could add in. I'm quite active there, so I could reply uh, whatever inquiries that you have. And uh, if you want to learn more about these kind of contents, that I also have a podcast session. So I co-host this podcast with one of the data science SG, uh, data science Singapore co-founder, Ku. If you are, if you know him, uh, yeah, I also do po uh, podcast co-hosting with Ku. It's called Symbolic Connection Podcast. You could find us on Telegram. Uh, you could find us on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and uh, Anchor. Right, a lot of the mainstream platform we are already there. Uh, yep. So yep. Uh, just one more thing before I go. Uh, as you know, my uh, my whole country now is being uh, traumatized by a lot of uh, terrorist organization. I would say it used to be uh, military, but we are trying to. They're trying to instill fear into the people so that their regiming works. Uh, so the kids over there has been uh, really traumatized because uh, this tribe is actually a Christian tribe. If anything happened to them, they actually go into the church because that's where they think is safe. But when when they go inside, the military shoot the church. As you can see from the left side, there's a, there's a, there's a hole in it, right? Uh, it's a very irony because this means actually peace. Peace Church, something like that. But yeah, they've been shot down inside the church. Imagine how how frightened they might be. And yeah, if you want to help these kind of uh, unfortunate kids, right? They are trying to yeah. There are a lot of uh, GoFundMe things here over there, and you could try this link. And if you want to uh, in, individually contribute in a more capacity, you could also talk to me, and I can link you up with the the volunteer over there 
to to do more things about it. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for giving me a chance to to share about this as well, uh, Chashing. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, with this, I will end my slides. And if you have any questions, I would like to take you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tura, and thank you for answering the audience questions uh, even during your presentation. So um, yeah, I think uh, if there are a few more questions coming in, uh, Tuya will be able to reply you on chat as well. So feel free to uh, leave it there or also connect with him via LinkedIn. Yep. Uh, and with that, uh, we will introduce our second speaker for today. So uh, Ramsha, the next up we have Ramsha Siddiqui, a machine learning engineer working on the domain of conversational AI and knowledge logistics at Boomtown. She's a woman tech maker, ambassador, scholar, and lead at Google Developers Group Lahore. And she's also one of Google's Women Developer Academy graduate. Ramsha will be sharing how you can add conf conference resolution to your chatbot's natural language understanding in order to extract references from context. This session includes an example implemented in TensorFlow and will show you how you can build your own contextually aware chatbot. The stage is yours, Ramsha. Hi everyone, thank you Gia for um, yeah, handing it over. Uh, okay, so today's talk is about co-reference resolution in TensorFlow, which is a common natural language processing problem with applications in question answering, automatic summarization, machine translation, you name it. Uh, Gia has already introduced me, so I'm going to skip over my introduction. I work in machine learning. I've been working in it for around two years, and I recently graduated university, so I'm still new to uh, you know most of these things. Okay, so to start off, what is co-reference resolution, and what does it have to do with conversations or chats? Uh, well, co-reference resolution is the task which is commonly achieved through machine learning of finding all of the expressions in a text that refer to the same entity. So for example, in this chat, um, you can see that she in the third message is um, being referred to, to the user's sister that's mentioned in the first message. Um, similarly, you can see that the word my in my sister in the first message by the user is not a reference to the me in the second message by the bot because these are different speakers. But you'll see that John in the first message by the user my friend John, is referenced by the bot um, as him in the second message. So these two examples show that not every pair of um, expressions is a core reference, even though they seem like they're using the same pronouns like me and my, but multiple users can um, you know, access or um, refer to the same e expressions or real world entities that were once defined in the conversation history by themselves or by someone else. So these expressions that refer to real world entities um, in this domain are known as mentions. And the task of finding them is the first one in Go reference resolution. So in this example, you can see that there are four real world entities, the user, the bot, um, the user's sister, and the user's sister's friend, John. <laughs> so in total, there are six mentions of these entities that are all highlighted. So. Let's now look into how do we successfully execute the task of mention detection and what features do we need for it? Well, the first set of features that are rather obvious are named entities. Um, named entities are predefined categories such as you know, names of people or organizations, companies, um, geographical locations, um, dates or times, quantities, money, etc. So everything that you can extract using rules or heuristics like regular expressions or you know, with a pick list, like a list of all of the countries in the world, or even with machine learning models that are specifically written for named entity recognition. Um, yeah, these features would be really useful for um, finding mentions. The second set of features at the word level that help define the parts of speech associated with words in a sentence are based on grammar rules, which are called um, parts of speech tags or POS tags. So for example, here you can see that Alex Smith and Acme Corp Incorporated, they're both um, you know, proper nouns. So that means that these are probably entity mentions. And the same would apply for you know, other nouns and pronouns. So this makes a good feature for mention detection. 
Um, a third set of features that is really helpful is called dependency tags. So if we break down a sentence by grammar rules into several small components that are either words or you know, couples of words like phrases, then assigning roles to these components um, really helps parse a sentence into meaningful portions. So in this example, you can see that the subjects and objects um, are very likely to be entity mentions that are even correlated or co-referenced with each other. So extracting these three features via rule-based NLP or pre-trained models, here's a simple architecture that implements a model for mention detection. So here per word, we are using features like the clean token, the POS and NER tag, um, the word casing and the head dependency and passing these features through a recurrent neural network that's kind of custom designed as mentioned in the paper. Um, after that, we generate a hidden representation of each of the words internally and then finally apply a binary softmax decision on whether or not the word is a mention. Now, we could manually test out various different you know, word level feature combinations for building the perfect model, or we can simply use word vectors that learn the same features inside a model's embedding matrix via backpropagation. So here we have results of male versus female mentions of entities for a pre-trained model on the left, where you'll see that they all kind of overlap with each other. Whereas on the right, trained embeddings on a mention detection task clearly separate the two. So this image is from Neural Coref, which is an implementation by Hugging Face, which proves a point that the model was able to learn distinction between different kinds of mentions, male and female, by training on the task of mention detection. So automatically, instead of feeding these features you know, to the model manually, the model was able to learn this. Um, so that means that you know, choosing embeddings or word vectors for this kind of task is um, definitely the superior choice to make. Yeah, so right, to write out the recurrent neural network architecture for the model that I just showed, um, using embeddings instead of you know, handmade features, um, the simplest architecture in TensorFlow would only take four lines of code. We start with a sequential model that takes as input token IDs for each word in a sentence. This is connected to an embedding layer that indexes word vectors, each of length 64, for every token ID in that sentence. Then these vectors go through a recurrent layer of dimension 128. And you can add more recurrent layers here or even change you know, the number of hidden units inside them based on your chatbot's um, data or your model's validation performance. Finally, a softmax activation per word gives you the output of entity mentions in your sentence. Now, this architecture is rather simplistic with binary classifications. So you can also train a model which predicts mention types or categories, such as person, location, etc., and perhaps also predict the span of each mention, as in which word starts the entity, which word lies inside it, and you know which word ends the entity, etc. Either way, um, you would only be changing the final output layer of your model, and the rest of the architecture will more or less stay the same. All right, so now that we have um, detected mentions, how do we use them to resolve co-references? That's step two. So um, in the previous um, example of mention detection, you can probably tell that just using classification outputs would lose information, right? So we will end up with probably more false positives than we'd prefer. For example, her is a feminine pronoun, which is more likely correlated to my sister than my friend John. So if I just use outputs of every mention, um, just the classification outputs, it wouldn't make sense to compare every classification output with every other one and then um, you know, find out some, use some way of like, um, you know, changing uh, the, the, the results between them. So instead of using classification outputs, we want to use the vector representations that are learned by the mention detection model to in that, you know, that encapsulates that information. So um, the classification outputs would just be used for filtering out the entities or the mentions that we want to compare. But then for you know, linking multiple entities together, we, we would be using their hidden representations or their word vectors. 
So here's an example architecture that was referenced by Neural Coref. So here you see that single mentions are used to find which entities are likely to be mentions. And then we can compare each pair of mentions for possible correlation um, if we are sure of you know, single mention detection. Um, and you can use um, different sorts of uh, features, not just the word vectors. Um, so in this task, you see that uh, they've used word vectors as well as additional features like the distance between two mentions and um, whether two mentions are exact word matches, et cetera. And they also have um, you know, additional features of per word, like um, NER, parts of speech, et cetera. So um, these features would be called the mention representation um, for, for every mention that you have. So great. Now that we have the third step, um, you know, the second step done, the third step would finally be to define the model for entity linking. So note here that the data you'll be using to train all of this would be your own, or at least an open source data, um, and you would require it for training each of your models. So as shown before, our training data would be pairs of entity mentions, and for each pair, we would optimize binary cross entropy loss of whether or not it's a pair of co-reference. So a simple architecture for that is shown here. Um, this is reference from another paper. Uh, we start by concatenating the vectors of every mention and candidate, as well as additional features that might go along with it. Um, we pass it through a deep neural network and end it in a sigmoid classification of whether or not it's, um, it's a co-reference pair. So continuing code for this in TensorFlow, you will concatenate um, the vectors for your mention and candidate, and then pass it through three dense layers of dimensions 256, 128, and 64. Again, you can play around with this, use different layers, or use different dimensions. This is your choice, or based on your model's performance. Finally, you have a sigmoid classification layer that gives us a confidence score of how likely this mentioned candidate pair is a co-reference. So another way to do this could also be to softmax all over your candidates for the same mention via a method called pairwise ranking, where each pair gets a score from the model, and that pair that receives the best score is connected as a co-reference. So this can also be implemented if you were trying to pass all of your mentions and candidates through the same network um, at once. Um, another method of um, implementing co-reference resolution could be using state-of-the-art NLP, where you create an end-to-end -end model for this task. Um, so this is an architecture diagram from Spanbert for this task. Um, they take every word and pairs of words to create spans out of them, and then they generate span representations or mention representations by performing summation over each of the hidden representations of the words. And then finally, the model goes through pairwise ranking to find the best mention and candidate pairs. So um, yeah, the network in between um, pairwise ranking and span representations um, in this paper was a transformer architecture, but you can also use an attention network or even a deep neural network um, if you're testing things out on your own. Well, <laughs> given all of the tips that I've given today, I hope you'll be able to build um, a core reference resolution model and start using it in your chatbots. Um, to use it in your chatbots for every past message, you'd want to keep a list of all of the mentions that have been, uh, you know, that have been mentioned by both your user and your bot. And then for every new message, you would want to compare the mentions in this new message with all of the mentions that have previously gone before. Um, and that way you'll be able to find co-references you know, across different messages. Um, that's it. I hope today's session was helpful for you. Feel free to leave comments on the video. Or if you have specific questions, you can also email me on this email. Uh, or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsha. <laughs> wonderful presentation. Thanks for being so clear. I love that you experimented on this project so <laughs> intensely. Yeah. Um, just mindful of time, that we're probably going to skip Q and A right now. However, again, you have Ramsha's contact details over here, so you're welcome to reach out to her um, to get more questions. Thank you again for joining us today, Ramsha. I love having you. 
Thank you, Janice. Bye. Thanks. And next up, let's welcome Hadik Nahata. So Hadik is an AI engineer and an ad tech startup at Spectre Technologies. So he has deep expertise in AI, machine learning, and deep learning, working across diverse projects, leveraging computer vision and NLP across various industries. His session today will show how you can generate choices or distractors in multiple choice questions and identify the context of a word using word sense disambiguation. There will also be a live demo run of this solution and we love live demos. So stay tuned with us and thank you again for joining us to share about your project, Hadik. Over to you. Uh, am I audible? Yep, all good. Okay. Hi, guys. This is Hardik Nahata here from India. I hope you guys are doing good. Firstly, I'd like to thank Jiyashin for this amazing opportunity. And I'd like to thank to actually conduct these uh, developer open mic nights because not uh, everywhere this happens. You know, we have stand up comics doing stand ups on open mics, but nothing for developers because our content is not really relatable to everyone. So, People who are actually you know, interested into this or other developers can only relate to it. So it gives us a chance to speak about what stuff we are doing around. So without further ado, let's get started. So today we'll be talking about how we can use natural language processing to generate questions from any given text, right? So as uh, Jasine has already told about me a bit, I'd like to keep it short. So these are some of, some of the experience listed. I've worked at Winwire Technologies. I've worked in hybrid app development. And also in 2019, I was working as a research assistant at Nanyang Technological University. And post that, I graduated last year in, with a bachelor's in computer science. And I've been working as a machine learning engineer at Koei Leader. And now the, the current uh, company where I'm working at is called Aspector Technologies. And we're working in EdTech. So let's get started. So I want you to pay attention to the content on the left side. There's a small paragraph about Asia over here. And this is kind of the input to our uh, solution or model. And on the right side, you see, we have a multiple choice question generated from this content. Now the keyword here or the answer here to the question above that dash is separated from Europe by the Ural Mountains on the West. The answer is Asia. And that's pretty easy to actually pick from the given content on the left side, because we can see that. But what about the other options? How do we come up with these wrong options, which are, you know, uh, possible answers, but also not very different from what is actually to be shown. So this is a key point, and that's what we're trying to solve here. And let's see how it happens. First, I'd like to take you to the pipeline flow a bit, and then we can go into it deeper. So we start with the input text over here, a block of text, and this is sent to text summarization and keyword extraction. Okay. Now the boxes in blue shows what activity is happening on the input and the box in black shows what kind of uh, uh, library or model we are using to do that, okay? So the text summarization happens with Google Bird model served by Hugging Face and the keyword extraction happens with PKE that is Python key phrase extraction. Now, once we get the summarized text that is sent for sentence tokenization, basically we're trying to take out the sentences from the summarized text and also the keywords which are received are sent for sentence mapping with keywords. I know this sounds a bit complex, but just stick with me through the pipeline. When we delve into it, you'll, you'll, you'll find it more easier to understand. So the sentences generated from the tokenization and the keywords extracted are sent for sentence mapping to flash text. Once we get these sentences and their respective keywords, these are sent for distractors generation. Distractors are nothing but wrong options, which we saw earlier. Now, this can be done through three algorithms or models, SenseToVec, WordNet, and ConceptNet. This is not a pipeline or flow of the three algorithms. This is more like an option, which you would like to go ahead to, uh, to generate the distractors. And these distractors are further go, uh, uh, end up being on a MCQ questions, right? Now let's delve into it. Now, firstly, we have the Google Bird model for extractive text summarization. Now, what is text summarization basically? If you see the small image on the left side, we have a lot of text in book and we are trying to summarize it into a short summary while still retaining the important information from the text. So this is nothing but text summarization in a, in a short uh, uh, line, you, can, you could say. And there are different types of summarization that is abstractive and extractive. Abstractive is nothing but, you know, we are trying to 
uh, rewrite the text in a way and condense it right we are changing the words of the text that is abstractive now extractive is something which you would take with a highlighter and highlight sentences in a piece of text so you are picking the important sentences of the whole content now that's what we are employing here that is extractive text summarization and to do this we are using the google bert model bert is nothing but bidirectional encoder representation from transformers and if you've been into the nlp industry for a while you you know that uh, transformers have done state of the art uh, uh, results on variety of nlp tasks and these are like the go to models right now and be, being served by hugging face these, these are like very easy to you know deploy and run so that's why you're using bert model over here for text summarization the next module was the python key phrase extraction so what happens here is basically pk is an open source key phrase extraction toolkit it contains multiple models which are supervised and unsupervised uh, according to whatever you want to use you can pick from there it's a big library and what we are doing is we are using unsupervised multipartite graph key phrase extraction algorithm over here so what this does is the whole content of our document or text is sent into the uh, unsupervised model and this creates a multipartite multipartite graph unsupervised multipartite graph which actually holds the information of the whole document and also what it does is it uh, separates the topics and the sentences and uh, it uses the correlation between them to rank these results as key phrases and the result of this algorithm gives us some top n ranked uh, candidates which we pick as our key phrases and these key phrases are further uh, condensed to get our keywords for our uh, distractors we'll see that later how we use them but what you need to keep in mind is that we get n top ranked candidates from the model as keywords right that's what pk gives us now coming to flash text flash text is nothing but a very small library but it is very useful because it is way more faster than regex for searching and replacing so the major use of fast uh, flash text is for uh, word replacement and for word searching now if you see the graphs here is the uh, graph of word text uh, flash text versus regex on the searching criteria you see how it increases with the number of terms the time is more for regex but for flash text it takes very less time similarly in replacing words that's what that's why we're using it and the reason why it's fast is it uses try data structure if you uh, if you're into data structure algorithms you might have heard about try it's a very efficient data structure to access uh, 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 text data right it's also used in uh, uh, you know mobile uh, uh, contacts app something like that so that's why we're using it uh, so because it gives us faster uh, faster efficiency to access our data and uh, next coming to the main piece that is generating distractors i want you to pay attention here our keyword here is rose the flower okay now what we are trying to do is there is a concept called hypernyme and home hyponyms in english okay so the hypernyme of rose is flower so basically you can take this as a hierarchy okay so the hypernyme of rose is flower once we are at the hypernyme we can go to the home hyponyms of flower now which is orchid jasmine tulip and other flowers so the concept here is from our keyword we go to one step above to the hypernyme and then we comes one step down to the hyponyme so this gives us options uh, you know these could be our uh, possible options for distractors and this is what is used in wordnet now what is wordnet wordnet is nothing but an open source lexical database of english so this is human annotated and it holds a lot of relationship and data about the english key english words right and it's somewhat like a thesaurus you could say but it also captures the semantics and relations between words okay and wordnet also captures the different meanings or synset of a word this is an important point and we'll come to this for example mouse could be the animal mouse and the computer mouse now wordnet holds the information that which word is it and this meaning is called a synset okay now coming to the snippet from collab where i'm trying to use wordnet on the word red okay so if you see uh when i'm entering the word red and we go to the hypernyme we get as chromatic color because red is a color that's what we got now we using the hypernyme which we got when we try to go to the hyponyme that is a level below we try to get other colors green olive orange and you can see these could be the distractors for the color red so that's how we are using wordnet and this is one of the three algorithms which we, which we can use and there are others which we can check out right now okay now before we do that in wordnet itself we need to understand word sense disambiguation and for that you can consider these two sentences i went to the bank to withdraw money and heavy rains overflowed the river bank now you see the word bank is same in both the sentences but the meaning is completely different 
and that is why we need word sense disambiguation so that we can differ the meaning and the model can understand which context is the word being used in right now for that we are using pywsd that is python implementations of word sense disambiguation library now there are multiple algorithms over there to handle such problems we are using max similarity and rapid lesc what max similarity algorithm does is uh, as i said since it is the sense of a word so max similarity tries to maximize the sensets of all the words in the sentence and compare it with the ambig ambiguous words sensor that is bank and by maximizing the similarity we get to know which context this could rely on and that is how we disambiguate the meaning right now coming to concept net this is an, uh, apart from word net this is not a flow this is more like an option as i told you concept net is a human annotated multilingual knowledge graph the point to be noted here is word net is only in english but concept net is multilingual so it ha has a large uh, database okay now it was originated in uh, uh, 1999 in the mit media lab and concept net labels the semantic relationship among, among words but they are more detailed compared to word net now there are multiple relationships held in concept net for a word which the the relationships could be is a part of similar to kind of relationships you could better understand with this example on the right side uh, you could you can check check out concept net on conceptnet.io this is their website and it is uh, you can just type in any word and see the relations it holds now i tried with entering the word color if you see the related terms are blue paint red blue green and the types of color are also given these are just couple of them there are more than like 10 relations i think you know for example if you take united states california is a part of united states texas is a part of united this is a part of is the kind of relationship which is held over there so you could utilize these different relations in order to uh, get distractors for your keywords right and how we can use this concept net provides an api for public use which has an early usage capacity so it's not really great for production deployments i'm not sure if they have a paid one available but there is a limitation to it but it helps lot of knowledge more than wordnet that's why this is better now third one is sense to vec sense to vec is different from wordnet and conceptnet in a way that this is not human annotated first thing these are more like word vectors something what ramsha was referring to earlier right so sense to vec generates vector space representation of words right sense to vec creates embedding for sentences rather than tokens of words so we have embeddings for the senses not the words so the uh, the benefit of using sense to vec is for example if you consider the word apple apple could be the you know the company apple and the apple could also be the uh, fruit apple so similarly to address this we have two different vectors in sense to vec so that the model can completely understand the difference and we don't have the word sense disambiguation issue over here there's a company called explosion.ai which has trained a uh, sense to vec model on reddit comments from 2015 and 20, 2019 and these models are publicly available to download and they have also served a simple api over at explosion.ai now for example on the right side if i write machine learning the most correlated uh, topics are data science natural language processing and other secancy and the percentage of confidence is also given so this is very useful again to generate the distractors right now i'll show you a quick demo with streamlit i'm not sure if you have heard about the library uh jia yeah, i am unable to switch my screen can you help me out yep go ahead yeah i think it's working now so yep looks good yeah so this is the, uh, this is the window where i am serving locally the mcq generation using nlp project and this is the content i'm passing into we saw the same content in the initial slide right asia and i'll just run this and until this runs i'll like to show you uh, how you can use uh, streamlit to serve your ml models locally within around 15 to 16 lines of code here i'm just importing the streamlit library and i'm giving a title to the page i'm i, I mind you i have not written any html over here right this is the only code to serve it on the browser and here i have created a text area where i just entered the sentence right and once the sentence is entered i'm calling my uh, function to generate the mcqs and i'm just writing whatever response i got so you see within 15 lines of code we have created a complete web page with input and output so it is very easy to you know quickly check your model and you know just show it to the uh, your, your boss or you know a business decision maker you can also share link 
to the model. So I just wanted to stream it because it's very nice. Now let's see, uh, our results are here, right? I entered this piece of text and here's the question, which we saw, Dash is separated from Europe by Ural Mountains, Asia, and the options are Latin America, Philippines, South America. These options look good, right? And there's another one here. And the options again are pretty similar to Europe. Europe is the correct answer. And the other options, which are good distractors. So similarly, we have others, but yeah, I guess you get the point. And I think uh, that's about the demo. And thank you a lot for giving me the opportunity and joining us here. And you can feel free to get connected on my social media handles. And I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. And if you have any other questions, you can shoot a mail at uh, hardiknata at .spector.tech. And that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you for Hi, joining us. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think um, if we have any questions for Hadik, uh, feel free to leave them on our live chat. He will be able to answer them there as well. Uh, really interesting presentation. Thank you so much for joining us, Hadik. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gia. Thank you, Janice. Thanks to everyone. Thanks once again to Tuya, Ramsha, and Hadik for sharing their projects with us today. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining LACOPI. And let me just add my slides in really quickly. Yep, and if you would like to rewatch this session, there was a comment asking whether our session will still be available. Um, so the answer is yes, it will still be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, do keep updated with us on all our social media channels over there. And our event, uh, Startup Coffee Chat, is also happening in two weeks' time. Uh, do join us to learn from engineering and product leaders from startups on um, scaling teams and the best practices and their experiences and journeys. And thanks again for staying true with us. And we really want to hear your feedback about the event. So provide us with your email address or do it anonymously. But if you leave, leave your email address, we'll be selecting five lucky winners for some cool stacks. So remember to check your inbox later this week to see if you have won any of the prizes. Meanwhile, stay tuned for our upcoming event on our website and social channel, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everyone, again, for joining us. Uh, I know we overshot a little, but uh, yeah, we can see that there are quite a couple of you who are still here. So yeah, do leave your feedback and let us know how we can do better for future events. See you all again next month. Goodbye.